In the 12th century, it was home to lepers. And in the 1960s, it was the home to rock musicians. Shunned by society, seen as filthy, dirty and infectious, rock musicians were very popular in the 1960s and Denmark Street was where you'd find them. Hi, I'm Kev F, currently working on my second graphic novel, my adaptation of Shakespeare's Hamlet, which I'm calling The Prince of Denmark Street. I've been making a series of work in progress videos, uh, you might have seen them, uh, but today we're not going to talk about Shakespeare, we're not going to talk about comics, we're not even going to talk about me. Today I'm going to give you a brief history of Denmark Street. Denmark Street is on the edge of the West End in London, coming off Charing Cross Road in the shadow of Centrepoint, joining up with St Giles High Street. And if you've been to London, you'll know it as the place with the guitar shops, though how long that's going to be the case is a concern. Denmark Street is known as London's Tin Pan Alley, named after New York's Tin Pan Alley, the one-time home of the music business. Tin Pan Alley, New York, is West 28th Street in Manhattan between 5th and 6th, and it was where their music business was centred in the early 20th century. Songwriters like Irving Berlin churned out sheet music for popular performers. It was big from the 1890s to the Second World War. The rock and roll era supplanted Tin Pan Alley. In 1965, Dylan said, and I won't do the Bob Dylan voice, uh, Bob Dylan said, Tin Pan Alley is gone. I put an end to it. People can record their own songs now. I'm, I'm not famed for my Bob Dylan impersonation. So, Denmark Street became London's Tin Pan Alley when, in 1911, Lawrence Wright, a music publisher, set up shop there. He was the guy who went on to establish Melody Maker, the music paper which lasted from 1926 right up until 2000. Before Denmark Street became associated with the music biz, it had a pretty impressive history. As a street, it goes back further than any street in New York, for starters. In the 12th century, Maud, the wife of Henry I, founded St Giles Hospital, a house for lepers. Denmark Street grew up in what would have been the hospital grounds. This whole area was known as St Giles. You'll find St Giles in the Fields Church, right at the foot of the road. One of the oldest surviving buildings is now 26 Denmark Street, which would become the 12 Bar Club. This was built in 1635 as a stables part of the hospital, and the building was kept when the rest of the street was built. Visitors to the 12 Bar Club could still see where the stable blocks had been. It was used as a blacksmith's right up until the First World War. Denmark Street as a whole was developed sometime between 1682 and 1687. We know this because it doesn't feature on a very detailed map called Morden and Lee's map, and that was finished in 1682. Denmark Street was named after Prince George of Denmark, who'd married Princess Anne, daughter of James II and VI, in 1683. Anne went on to become Queen Anne in 1702. Famous legs, very famous for her legs. It was a fairly posh street of three and four storey townhouses, Denmark Street. Famous residents included Johann Zoffany, the 18th century society painter, Dr John Purcell, who wrote a treatise on vapours and hysteric fits, which I'm sure we've all read, and Sir John Murray, Baron Stanhope of Broughton, who was captured after the Battle of Culloden, brought down to London, ratted on his fellow Jacobites and died in obscurity. They're all worth googling, by the way, as is Augustus Sieb, probably not pronounced Sieb, S-I-E-B-E. -E. Augustus Sieb, he lived at number five Denmark Street and invented the diving helmet. The early 19th century is when the ground floors of Denmark Street started being converted into shops and a lot of the back rooms became workshops. Metalwork was a particularly big business and has absolutely no link to the Tin Pan Alley name in case you were wondering. In fact, before the name Tin Pan Alley was bandied about, Denmark Street was known as Little Tokyo because, around the 1930s, a number of Japanese businesses set up there. The Tokiwa Restaurant and Hotel were at numbers 8 and 22, and number 6 was a bookshop called Azakami & Co. The Tin Pan Alley reputation was growing through the 1920s. Lawrence Wright, music publisher, was at number eight, then later at number 11. Campbell Connolly was another music publisher that set up there early on. And number seven was home to Box and Cox Publishing, whose best remembered hit is I've Got a Lovely Bunch of Coconuts, 
written by Harold Box and Desmond Cox in 1944, I've Got a Lovely Bunch of Coconuts went on to be a hit for Danny Kaye and, trivia fans, bits of the song are sung in The Lion King, sung by Rowan Atkinson, in Magical Mystery Tour, sung by Ringo Starr, and in the film National Treasure, sung by Nicolas Cage. There's a pub quiz answer that'll come in handy someday. It was after the Second World War that the music business really made Denmark Street its home. The American publisher Mills Music set up offices there, and Larry Parnes, the music mogul, became one of the biggest buyers of music written on the street for his acts like Tommy Steele and Marty Wilde. Uh, one of his most popular writers was Lionel Bart, the author of Living Doll and Little White Bull, who went on to write Oliver. For a time, Lionel Bart became the first person to be referred to as the King of Denmark Street. In 1952, Denmark Street became home to the most famous music paper of them all, the NME, or New Musical Express. Morris Kinn bought the ailing Accordion Times and Musical Express, branded it the New Musical Express, and, from his offices at number 5 Denmark Street, the same place where Augustus Sieb had invented the diving helmet, published the weekly paper that included the UK's first ever singles chart. And who was number one? Al Martino. Everybody knows it's Al Martino. The NME moved offices in 1964, but went on to be the most influential music paper in the UK through its heydays of the 70s and 90s. And though it stopped being published uh, as a printed magazine in 2018, it lives on online and as an unrivaled archive. The next step in Denmark Street's musical history was when the recording studios sprang up. The eponymous Tin Pan Alley Studios was established in the basement of number 22 in 1954. Regent Studios opened up at number 4 above the offices of Essex Music Publishing in 1961, although their website does suggest that there could have been a studio there as long ago as the 1930s. Their owner, Lord Baring of Baring's Banks, was a young socialite and friend of the stars, and he attracted the happening new rock and roll bands to record there. So the Rolling Stones' first album was recorded at Regent Studios, and it went on to be used by The Kinks, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, The Bee Gees, Slade, literally hundreds of others. Regent Studios kept running until the 1980s, when the last acts to use it included Banana Rama, but its technology was eventually eventually surpassed by newer places and by the end of the 80s the studio had closed and become the Helter Skelter Music Bookshop. It's now the guitar shop Regent Sounds. Southern Music was another American publisher with its own Denmark Street Studios and a number of smaller studios were built in basements and former workshops. The close proximity of these various studios meant Denmark Street became the stomping ground for session musicians who could hop from job to job. Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones later of Led Zeppelin were two such very busy musicians and one of their popular haunts was the Giaconda Cafe. There's a plaque commemorating the Giaconda which spells its name Giaconda whereas photos of the place show its sign spelling it G-O-Conda. The Mona Lisa is spelt with an O so it looks like the plaque is actually spelt wrong. However you spell it, the Giaconda Cafe was the social hub for the London music industry of the 60s and 70s. David Bowie recruited his first band, the Lower Third, there, and the Small Faces were formed from musicians who just used to hang out. By 1970, Dick James's DJM Records had set up offices at 20 Denmark Street, and it was on the roof of that building that Bernie Taupin sat on the roof and kicked off the moss, then wrote it down and gave it to Elton John, who set it to music and gave them their first big hit, the Sitting on the Roof, Kicking Off Moss song. Elton and Bernie mentioned Denmark Street in the song Bitter Fingers on the Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy album. There's also a song called Denmark Street on the Kinks 1970 album Lola vs Power Man and the Money Go Round Part 1. Basically, look on any album with an unnecessarily long title and there's probably a song about Denmark Street. In 1976, Malcolm McLaren had bought a rehearsal room on Denmark Street from the unfortunate band Badfinger, their story's worth reading by the way, and had it refurbished. So that's where the Sex Pistols recorded their first demos, while the whole band shared a flat above number six Denmark Street. John Lydon drew caricatures of the band on the wall of the flat that were rediscovered during renovation in recent years. 
The recording and music publishing businesses thrived throughout the 1970s and were joined by the even more visible guitar and music shops that began making Denmark Street their home following the opening of Top Gear Music in 1969. One of the biggest and best known shops was Andy's Guitars, which was at 27 Denmark Street from 1978 right up until 2007. Some older comic fans will remember passing the plethora of guitar and musical instrument shops from when they visited Forbidden Planet, the comic shop that opened at number 23 in 1978. This shop is featured in a Captain Britain story by Alan Moore and Alan Davis from 1983, uh, which was just before the shop moved off Denmark Street. And moving off the street was to become the story of the next few years. As recording studios began to die out and London rents continued to rise, eventually the music business migrated from Denmark Street to other parts of town. The last music publisher in the street was Peer Music, who left their offices at number 8 in 1992. Now, with the exception of Tin Pan Alley Studios at number 22, now renamed Denmark Street Studios, mostly only the guitar and music shops remained. They still included some legendary names such as Rose Morris and Co, who've been selling instruments on Denmark Street since 1919, and Argent Sheet Music at number 19, formed by keyboard player Rod Argent. It's still holding its head up. Do you see what I did there? Most stories you read from Denmark Street in the 1980s are less than glamorous. In 1980 there was a big fire caused by an arsonist that destroyed a bar above 18 Denmark Place, which backed onto the street, killing 37 people. And numbers 1 to 3 became the job centre, one of whose employees was the serial killer Dennis Nielsen. In 1990, a traders' association led by Andy Preston of Andy's Guitars tried to get Denmark Street rebranded as Musicland in the same way as there are areas like Theatreland and Chinatown attracting tourists and boosting the area's identity, but that didn't happen. With the development of the Crossrail Terminal on Chang Cross Road, the area around Denmark Street has seen demolition and rebuilding on a scale unseen since the 60s. In 2009, the street was put on English Heritage's at-risk register, with fears that buildings could be lost. In 2010, Camden Council identified Denmark Street and the adjacent buildings as a conservation area. And, as if to demonstrate quite how meaningless a term conservation area is, in 2013 the council announced that Denmark Street was going to be developed in conjunction with the crossrail work, meaning that 1 to 6 and 17 to 21 Denmark Place, backing onto Denmark Street, have been demolished, as has part of 21 Denmark Street itself. There are eight Grade 2 listed buildings on Denmark Street and, though these seem to be being modernised inside and look likely to become very expensive apartments, not the sort of place you'd let a young sex pistol draw on the walls of, the council seem to be preserving the facades of the building and are keen to ensure the shops remain solely in use for the music industry. How long that intention will last, we'll have to see. So there you have it, the brief history of Denmark Street. My story, The Prince of Denmark Street, is set during its heyday in 1977. Possibly in another video I'll have a look at how I've used the real locations in my made-up story. But for now, thanks for listening. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook at at KevF Comic Artist. And if you have any questions, please fire them at me. I'm happy to talk Shakespeare, happy to talk comics, happy to talk about me at any point. Cheers.